perfect. Okay, today we're going to be talking to Sarah, who is a success story who's gone through our program. And I don't know much about her situation, so I'm going to be kind of following along with the people listening here. So how are you, Sarah? Uh, I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. So why don't I just hand the mic to you and you tell me a bit about your situation and I'll just start asking you questions based on the first things that pop into my head. Sure. Okay. Um, I guess I should start by recapping what happened initially. Um, so we'd been dating, I had been dating my boyfriend for about eight months and to be honest, it was probably like the best relationship I've been in. Not that I've been in a lot. I only had one serious boyfriend before him, but from the get go, we kind of knew that we were in a weird spot because, uh, we were both living in Montreal, but we knew that by the end of the year, I would probably be relocating to the UK for grad school because, okay. I was applying to Oxford and UCL and a bunch of schools there. And like, I wanted to move on with my studies. And um, yeah, so the relationship went very well. Like we had our senses of humor really match and our personalities too. We had a lot of the same hobbies and we got along great with each other's friends. So all good sides, except right. that I could see that the idea of me eventually Going leaving. to UK. Yeah, that was like, he was a bit uncomfortable with that. And then uh, when the breakup happened, like he initiated it in October, I think. And um, yeah, I, it took me by surprise a bit because of a variety of reasons. Uh, for one, he did it when I was sick, actually. Uh, <laughs> so like, like you had the flu or something? Yeah, it, this was before the whole coronavirus thing. So, so I, it could have been the coronavirus, though. No. It actually, it, well, it was in October in Montreal, so I really don't think it was. But right, right. like, but it was like I don't get sick very often, and it was one of the worst flus that I've uh, had for a while. And uh, he, I, I told him the last the night before that, like, oh, I feel bad. And he was like, oh, can I come over? And I was like, no, because I feel gross. Right, but right. then he insisted to come over the next day and I was like, oh, cool. He wants to take care of me. And, uh, and no, you know, not Man. at all. Yeah. So he, he, what, was, what was the breakup talk like? What did he say exactly? Well, he did it in a very kind way, as kind as you can be in that type of situation, of course. Okay. And uh, he said that he just like didn't feel comfortable anymore, like being in a relationship where he saw no future because he knew that like I was getting my papers ready to move to the UK and everything was feeling a lot more real out of all of a sudden. And he said that, uh, plus it didn't seem like we had similar plans for the future. Like he was sure he didn't have, want to have kids. And I more or less thought I wanted to have kids, but I wasn't sure. And he said, yeah, basically like I'm not, comfortable being in a relationship where I don't see any future anymore. And um, I tried to take it well. I remember the first thing I said after that was like, of course, okay. And then I started crying. But So did you do that in front of him or after he had left? Oh, I totally did cry in front of him. Okay. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not proud to say that. But also, I mean, I was sick. I had a fever. I was not in full control. So did, did at, at any point during the breakup, did you think like, this, like I must be dreaming, like I'm having like a fever dream or something. This can't be real. I didn't like, I didn't fully believe that, but I did say to his face, like I was, the whole relationship was very honest and the whole breakup was very honest too. It mm -hmm. felt like we were just kind of throwing our feelings at each other, but not in an aggressive way. Like we were just expressing them right on the go. And I said at some point, like, oh my god this feels like a nightmare he was like he kept apologizing he apologized a lot and i could see that like he's not a crier he doesn't cry a lot but uh, he was not blowing up no, yeah he was upset he was not in a good place and uh, at some point i asked for a hug and he said like yeah of course and he just hugged me for a while and i was like please can you like can we talk about this can like if you're gonna break up with me can you at least like stick around to hear what i have to say for a while he was like yeah of course like i'll stay as long as you want and while we were talking at some point he said also like you know you're allowed to get mad at me like i completely understand if you get mad at me plus like 
um, yeah, and I remember I kept asking him, like, I don't know if I apologize, but I kept asking him, like, did I make you happy? Like, I just need to know, did you ever look, like, did I make you happy at least? Did I succeed in doing that? Right, right. And he kept saying, like, yes, yes, and, like, I'm not going to forget you and stuff like that. And do you, do you think he initiated the breakup mostly because he knew you were going to be going away to the UK? I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, people have said to me that like, you know, there's always another reason. And I've wondered myself, like, you know, mm. I must have done something like maybe I let myself go. Maybe I wasn't like um, dressing up as much as I used to when we first started dating or stuff like that. But I think the main thing he decided was that, and when I told my family about it, because I'm very close with my family and I immediately went to them afterwards. Right. Uh, they said like, it does sound exactly like he knows that you're going to be leaving and he's afraid that you're going to like break up first. Per- so he protecting, he's like protecting himself. Yeah. Sort of like a pre- premature like attack to... Like a preemptive strike, right. you know? Yeah, like- exactly. <laughs> Sorry, that's the word I was looking for, not attack. Yeah. Um, so obviously this breakup is sort of devastating even more so because you have the flu. Um, yeah. But what happens next? Because you go, eventually you get him back. So obviously what, what happens next to make that happen? Well, um, let's just let's just say at first that like I didn't find your website until like at least two or three weeks later. Okay, so that. you you were just did like in those two or three weeks, what had you done that was like not okay or okay or like because it's like, like according it, to your rules or yeah yeah according okay. to the rules. Well, one thing that I perhaps like, I don't regret doing it. I think it was actually the right thing to do because. Uh, immediately after the breakup happened, I told my pa- family about it, told my sister, told my best friends about it, and had a lot of people come over because I was like, I can't be alone right now. Just not a good idea. Right. And most of them asked me, like, you should probably talk to him because it sounds like he's scared shitless, but that he doesn't really want to do this himself. Right. So, like the preemptive strike type thing. Yeah. And that also, like, he kind of sprang this on you. Like, he bit, literally came to your house with like all of your stuff in the box and just left it on your doorstep kind so of it was while like, you had the flu. Yeah. It was like planning it out. Like, like I don't want to get hurt maybe. So I'm kind just going to do this. Yeah. And I, I just felt like I didn't have my Closure. time to speak. Yeah. And I wanted to tell him everything I thought and be like, almost give him like rational arguments for like why you're making a mistake right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I, like he broke up with me on a Monday, I think. And I asked him to come over to my house on a Friday to talk. Okay. And like, yeah, basically I sent him a text. I was like, um, I think that I deserve my turn to speak. And I would like to um, talk with you a bit more, ask you some stuff to make sure I have an understanding of what's going on and what are your reasons. Do you mind like coming to my house to talk about this for like sometime this week? And if you don't want to i completely understand and just forget i said anything he said Mm -hmm. yeah of course like uh would you rather i come to your house or not or somewhere a bit more neutral maybe and i said my house is better and um i gave him basically all my reasons as rationally as possible and he still wasn't really having it but he said like um thank you for telling me this and like i think it's very brave of you to ask me to come over and like tell me all this and um, he said he thought that I was a lot braver than him. And I was like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and uh, at the end of this, we were still broken up, unfortunately. But I was like, all of this happened with like some tears, some crying, hugging again. And at the end of it, I just told him basically like, um, no matter what happens between us and no matter if we can be friends or date again in the future, I just want you to know that Um, you deserve to end up with someone who makes you happy and you deserve a good person to be with you. And I mostly said that because I knew that the relationship he had before me was not very healthy, basically, and had made him uh, very unhappy at some points. And like, I guess I was also afraid that by breaking up with me, he would feel guilty and that would make him think that he didn't deserve to be happy or something. So I wanted Mm -hmm. to make like... I told him to seem like you're a good person and you deserve to be happy. 
and we kind of hugged it out, kissed for a last time, and then he left my house. And then immediately after that, like two days later, I went to France where my family lives. And uh, because I needed to be home, basically. I needed to see my parents, my sister. So you I, left. You left. I, I left the country, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you left the country. Yeah. Like, that's a true no contact rule right there. <laughs> I, I guess it is, yeah. And, like, um, I don't think I immediately unfollowed him, but I spent a lot of time off social media. And, like, just before getting on the plane, I sent him one last message. It was, like, a gift from Futurama. I don't know if you know the show. Oh, yeah, I know Futurama. Yeah, th- that time when Leela says to Fry, like, uh, Fry, the time we had together was short, but it was the best time of our life. And it's cheesy as fuck, I know. But I no, 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 that. were you guys, that is that like a, um, like a normal aspect of your relationship where you send oh, yeah. memes or gifts back and forth, yeah. like, like uh, pop culture type stuff? Yeah, 100%. Okay, so 100%. that's just normal. That's just normal for you. Well, yeah. Pretty, but, still, I mean, the context is a little, yeah, we, yeah, yeah I, was, I get where you're coming from, though. Yeah, but, like, it was kind of a, like, send and go, because I sent this right before getting on the plane, and there was no connection, you know? Right. And um, the last two weeks, I was at my parents, and I just, uh, I had, I'd never heard of the no contact rule before, but I was already thinking, like, Anna, like, you don't, like, you can't be desperate, you can't be, just don't text him, don't, don't anything him. Like, I talked to his friends a bit, to one of his friends especially, who was still like rooting very hard for us and was like, you might get back together in the future. I was, also... it, was it a girlfriend or a guy friend? Um, I think right now they identify as non-binary, but at that time they identified as uh, a woman. Okay. So yeah, and um, I was pretty close with him. It was maybe like the closest friend in his circle that I knew that makes sense so they that this person was cheering for both yeah for, yeah, for you guys was, to get back together yeah she they were saying basically like i don't understand why exactly he did this i don't think he was in the best state of mind they actually mentioned that he might be um depressed and suicidal too which got me just hmm. the two first weeks after the breakup was hell for me because yeah it's pretty tough because like i was miserable and i was also thinking like he's maybe in a weird state of mind. Like he might be really miserable too. And he might like, he might not be exactly there. And I want to make sure that he's not isolating, you know, he's not doing something bad to himself. But in the third week that I was at my parents, I found your website through, I don't remember what, I think it was through Google, like a mm-hmm. Google search. And um, so you just like wound up on an article there, started reading yeah. and just maybe got engrossed in, in the content. Yeah, I think the first article I found wasn't especially about like um, getting your partner back, but it was more about like how, like surviving the breakup, like okay. dealing with it. Right, and right. That was really what I was looking for. And, um, and then I got on your website and I found out what the website was for, among other things. And I discovered the ERP thing. Mm-hmm. And so you got into the Facebook group eventually. Yeah, I, I got into the Facebook group, but I, I never bought any of your books, actually. Okay, so you got into the Facebook group. Yeah. And what happens next? Um, well, I think at first I had to deal with a lot of, like, self-consciousness and awkwardness because, like, I, I don't want to offend you or anyone else who's no. in the group, but, like, it was just something that was very unlike me to do, like... Mm-hmm. I never imagined in my life I'd be doing this. And I've always prided myself on being like independent and very like individualistic, you know? And I, like, I don't even like the concept of relationships so much. And I've had people in my life, like friends, family members who are very dependent on romantic relationships. And I've seen how much damage that can do. So I was always like, that's never gonna be me. Like, I'm never gonna be desperate. I'm never gonna chase. And to be honest, signing up for that kind of Facebook group and following the advice from that kind of website did feel a little bit like chasing and being desperate sometimes. And mm-hmm. it like, so I had to deal with a lot of that, but. So in what way did you feel like it felt like chasing? Cause that's, that's, that's interesting to me. Yeah, I know that you frame a lot of your advice to be exactly the opposite of right, chasing. Right. Um, 
you you I, the chasing is it like reaching out uh first in text messages or like the type of text messages sent you oh, no. just jive with you what so no, what not, aspect was it well it's well at that time i was still in the not no contact period right okay. and i liked the no contact period because it was like 30 days where you just do nothing mm-hmm. where you think before acting where you like basically whatever you do don't be impulsive give yourself time to think and that really uh vibed with me for some reason but I guess what felt like chasing to me a little bit was um how organized and planned it felt like okay so it didn't seem natural like it yeah, didn't seem, exactly. or, it seem organic in a way it was like okay you have to follow the texting phase and then the phone call phase and then the uh dating phase yeah so, and then like the, the reach did, out with the text and the hooks that felt right kind of contrived okay yeah. so I've he- I've heard varying things about it uh, I've mm-hmm. heard your perspective. I've also heard people's perspective of like, oh yeah, you should do it. You should try it. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, I'm really curious to hear how you approached the situation because I'm mm-hmm. interviewing you trying to understand what you did that worked. So yeah. in your opinion, you felt like, okay, it looks a little contrived. It looks like too organized, too unnatural, yeah. so to speak. So what did you do? Did you follow it in that unnatural way or did you kind of put your own spin on it? Uh, no, actually, like, once, like, I took a look at the first, um, reach out text, and I was like, yeah, no, that's not going to be natural coming from me, so the first thing I did was, like, of course, like, stick to topics that we were both interested in, because, like, I don't want to talk about something that I'm not interested in, and it's the same for everyone, (laughs) and then, like, we had this habit of just not necessarily asking each other questions, or having this really very long text conversations but we just like send each other things we found funny like memes for example right right the futurama gif as an example that's not so much funny but but along those same lines along those same lines basically and that kind of went against uh the advice you gave on your website because a lot of this like they weren't open-ended questions you know and Mm -hmm. you said that that was but it was normal for your relationship Right. Exactly. And I think that's so a just very fit in the in the context of everything. Yeah. And I think uh like for me the reach out phase wasn't definitely wasn't as important actually as the no contact phase. So for you the no contact phase is where you did all that internal work yeah. and maybe even just sort of thinking. Like yeah. like in did did you and this is actually I'm looking for patterns and success mm-hmm. stories and this is a pattern that I've noticed. Did you feel like the no contact rule was like an essential aspect to getting your ex back because you built confidence during it? Like you rebuilt yourself up a little bit or was there some other aspect that I'm missing? Well, I think part of it was about rebuilding confidence, but like, let's be honest. I don't think that 30 days or even 45 days is enough sufficient to, to like make you the most confident in the world right exactly like it's not going to turn you into a different person and you should more likely it for that. in order for that to happen you'd probably it's like a lifelong pursuit yeah to, and to what it, but go ahead sorry yeah uh, what it did do was like um like I, i'd say i was already pretty confident like i like i know what kind of person i am and i know what i'm good at and what i can do before that and when the breakup happened, it just kind of threw everything in the air. And the no, the NC period was about remembering all that, basically. So getting back to sort of the version you felt before, because I mean, you got broken up with during arguably the worst time. You're sick, you're not yeah. feeling good, you're, you got a fever, and then he drops this <laughs> on you. So the emotions get involved in that. And maybe in that, it just kind of shell shocks you to enough to where you just like, I don't remember that person I was before all of this yeah. happened. Well, like, the NC period, I'd say, like, the first half of it was, actually, the first half of it was trying to get better from my cold, because <laughs> okay. it, was, it was a pretty bad cold. So, like, which uh, we still don't know if it's, if that was the coronavirus or not, for the Yeah, record. we don't know. Like, for the record, <laughs> maybe I'm immune to it now. Right, I don't know. Right. But, yeah, the first two weeks, maybe, was just, like, me feeling shitty emotionally and then getting distracted by how shitty I was feeling physically and then getting distracted by how bad I was feeling emotionally and like vice versa. And after that, it was a lot of um, just watching Netflix on autopilot, kind of like watching a lot of um, 
friends watching friends. a lot of yeah. that's like the number one netflix show too which is yeah which is funny it's just like it's not a high quality show by today's standards i guess i like, think it's pretty darn high quality it makes me laugh still to this day but i grew up when it was like coming like it was still on the air i remember yeah. it watching its finale well finale was in like 2000 or something i don't remember yeah it's pretty early but i remember the uh the ross and the plane thing because uh, i saw yeah. it live uh yeah i didn't see it live but i really very much did grow up with it so it was like a, a comfort show you know uh, i feel the same way about seinfeld um, i've i've never watched seinfeld but i've heard a uh, lot of good things it's about so it it's so funny but yeah that's that's the story i didn't grow up with it but i saw mm-hmm. it like you know on reruns but anyways, we're getting off topic. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, no. So um, you're talking about the no contact rule and sort of like the last half, the last 15 days. The last 15 days of the no contact rule. Well, during that time, I was spending a lot of time with family because like I was living with them again. And it was nice to be like, just like to watch movies with them, share meals with them. Like what I told my mom is like, please just take me out. Like bring me to distract stuff. Distract me. Yeah, exactly. So we did kind of all the super touristic things you do in Paris, which like... Had you ever all... been, have you ever been to Paris before? Oh, yeah. Like I was born there, actually. Oh, my, okay. Like, I've my only been one there. time and my, uh, my wife got sick like oh. the first day. And so I wanted to go out and like, like do all the touristy <sighs> things and we could barely do any of it. We saw the Eiffel Tower and we had one oh. really good day where we weren't, where, where, where she wasn't sick, but um, she's actually I'm allergic... Sorry she's allergic to egg and we don't speak oh. French. And so it's kind of oh. hard to explain that to, to, so we think she got, she got, um, food yeah, she probably, eats, yeah. yeah. So we won't be visiting Paris again anytime soon. Uh, sorry to hear that. I mean, French so cooking d- is great, but there's not as much that they do without eggs. So. That's the problem. Um, so anyways, you're, you're getting distracted throughout this period and yeah. obviously you're kind of, looking at some of the program, deciding about how you're going to reach out. You look at it, you decide, well, you know, it's not really me. I'm assuming the no contact rule finishes and you reach out first or does he reach out first? Oh no, I like, wait, I definitely reach out first. I can remember. And um, yeah, I think the first one I reached out with was something about politics because it's also like, it was a really interesting subject, you know, which kind of, I thought was a good idea to distract us, like not, as you said, like not immediately start with a memory text or something that's too close to the relationship. Right, just something that's going to make them respond. And you just, for whatever reason, you thought the the political type of text would work and it seems like it did, I'm assuming. Yeah, it did because he's he's very much into the politics of um, where he comes from. And I'm low key into the politics of like different countries because I come from like China and France and also like I was living in Montreal so had to keep up with kind of like all three so that was something we talked about a lot too so it was a familiar subject so what happens next (laughs) um what happens next I think he took like half a day to respond or something because of time zone differences probably Mm. and um it was funny because he was like oh like yeah, I think I think he asked me how I was doing. He was like, the way he texted definitely seemed like he was happy to hear news from me, you know, and maybe kind of relieved that I didn't hate him. Yeah. Also, I mean, you spent thirty days of ignoring him. Yeah. Um, and did did he reach out at all during those no. thirty days? No. no. Which and, uh, um, I ran a poll and found out that around sixty five percent of men will not reach out to you during no contact. Yeah. Which is and, interesting. Well, I think, like, I kind of expected it. Of course, I was hoping, like, most days to receive something from him. But I think also, like, this guy, this guy broke up with you, right? And if he, if he's still sticking to his decision, he's going to be like, okay, I don't need to talk to her. Like, we're not together anymore. But if he's feeling that he made a mistake and that he feels guilty, there might be an even higher chance that he won't reach out to you because he's going to be like, oh my god I hurt her so much she probably hates me right now she probably doesn't want to hear from me at all like I can't do that and I think that's where he was probably oh that's interesting and so you guys get into a conversation uh when do things really start to to 
to turn up, so to speak? Was well, it like was it like a pretty fast process, or because of the time zone differences, it took a little while to get things kind of going? Probably the time zone differences played a bit in that, and I think I kind of I tried to use that to my advantage because, like, I knew that there was a time zone difference, and that even if he was replying to my messages straight away, he wasn't able to because he'd probably be sleeping, right? So right. that actually helped me just be chill and not like obsessively check my messages for a response because logically I knew that it wasn't possible. And I also use that to my advantage in that like, I think one of your advice is like, don't jump into a normal conversation too soon. You gotta be just like, give him some crumbs and like give and take for a while. So mm -hmm. for about two more weeks, maybe more than that, I think we didn't actually have a real conversation as in more than like, it was just sort exchange. of back and forth, kind of yeah. just feeling each other out. And then what sparks the normal conversation? Um, I think it was once we had a little bit more time. I think it was about like three weeks after I sent out that first text that we started having slightly longer conversations. Okay, so you have the longer conversations, and at some point, I'm assuming you come back to your home and you don't have the time difference. Was yeah. that was that sort of played into the conversations? Like, how, I, I guess I'm you're you're texting back and forth, but eventually, do you guys get on the phone or you see each other in person? Well, like, what does it take to make that happen? Okay, here's the thing. Um, we both hate phone calls okay i think it's it's part of our generation thing like you'll see a lot of memes yeah, it's about, funny like, it's funny I, phone calls. I love phone calls um yeah. i'm not great at texting but uh i'm like, i'm kind of on the cusp of the millennial and the the generation before that so i'm i'm in this weird okay. area so i'm, I'm i kind of straddle both <laughs> huh. well i guess we're both in the like i'm 22 and he's 23 okay so you're definitely in the millennial age so texting is like the thing yeah, like phone calls is like, like, no, just no, no there's that, no that's, way that's we're old. doing that. That's like, that's like pagers to you guys. K kind of, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and it's just, it, it makes us both very uncomfortable. So like, I knew that wasn't going to be a so part of it. What about, what about like, like FaceTime or Skype or Zoom or things of that nature? Is that out of the realm or is it, is it basically just texting to in person for you guys? Uh, well, I like, I think we'd be okay with Skype or Zoom now, but the thing is, we had never Skyped before, so that... Okay, that's, just, like, weird then. Like yeah, you, like, you don't I didn't want to bring that in. Got yeah, it. Exactly. So it was just basically, like, you're, you're using text messaging to basically work towards seeing him in person. Yeah, and um, I did, like, I did kind of have fun getting him confused when we first started texting, because, like, ignore him for 30 days and then come out with a text about French politics, and he was like, French what? politics? Wait, like, right. did you move back to France or something? And I didn't really answer that right had away. You, had you been posting on social media at all during this time? Uh, like, that some you were on, in France? Yeah. I posted some pictures of me, like, in, the, in front of the Paris City Hall with my family. Okay. And, like, some pictures of was me. He, and, was he, like, still following you on social media, like, on Instagram or Facebook? He's just not very big on social media and especially Facebook. So I think he was seeing the posts, but he wasn't. He was going to comment or something. Okay. Yeah, no. He well, was seeing, it, seeing it's just as important, especially if you're texting him about uh, French Paul. I guess. And like, I think, I think he saw that because one of the posts I made about getting a new gig at Watch Mojo, actually, he saw it and he liked it. And then that was when we were texting and he sent me like, hey, congratulations. You know, like, I'm really happy for you because I knew that you were looking for work for a while. And I was like, yeah, thanks. And Okay, okay so he actually reached out to you to tell you congratulations on the on the job yeah okay that's pretty good yeah it was and then um when i when i was like about to come back home i gave him some hints but i didn't say exactly like which date or what time um and then he learned that through a snapchat i posted on my snap story so he's definitely paying attention to social media he's just not interacting with it yeah, except like when I did post that to my snap story, he sent me a snap saying like, hey, like, welcome back home and stuff. Okay. okay. When I hadn't notified him specifically about that. So you eventually come home, I'm assuming. Yeah. And how fast do things pick up when you get home? Well, I think for the first week or so, I, um, 
like I made it a priority to reconnect with friends basically and just spend a lot of time with my old friends and like having fun with them. And we kept the texting pretty much the same as it was before, except we replied a bit faster. And I think I noticed at one point that we were texting in the morning when I was, when I was already up and doing stuff. And he said at some point like, oh, I probably have to go. I'm gonna have to get out of bed. And I was like, oh, it's cool. Like he's texting me when he's not out of bed yet. Like that's a good sign. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then at some point I think that um, I said that I still had one of his shirts and that I wanted to give it back to him. So, so that, that's how you secured the in-person sort yes, of interaction there. Basically you yeah. had that instant date. Was that a conscious decision on you to not bring up the shirt until that point or was it just happenstance? Like you just got lucky? Oh, uh, I think it was happenstance because I didn't actually know that I still had that shirt. Okay. Like, I was living at my parents, right? And then I come back and I look through my clothes, like spring cleaning. And I'm like, oh, wow, this shirt isn't mine. It's probably his. Okay. So like, that was pretty natural. Actually, I just sent him a picture and I was like, is that your shirt? And he was like, yep, that's one of my favorite oh, so PJ beautiful. shirts. All yeah. right. Yeah, that's great. So that's what, what caused you to see him in person then. Yeah. Like at first he said, oh, you can keep it if you want to. And I was like, no, that's weird. What do you mean? Like, I was like, actually, like, it'd be nice if I could give you back your shirt. Like, want to meet up for coffee at some place? So we can like, so I can give you back your shirt. basically. <laughs> and he said, yeah, sure. How quick did it take him to respond to that text? Um, I don't remember the exact uh, time difference, but I think it was, was like, it like what, 20 minutes or something. Okay. So it was like pretty instant because sometimes you do that and you don't hear from him. You yeah. know, there was none of that. Not really, no. I did do the thing, like, I sent a text and just turned off my phone for okay. the rest of the day. And then, because I, I tend to do that normally anyways, but that really took the pressure off. Okay, so you turn off the phone, you turn it back on, you see the text from him. Exactly, yeah. How do you prepare for this meetup? Um, I don't, I think I did, I don't remember if I did a lot of, like, mentally calming myself down. I think... I did some like reading exercises probably before going. And um, I made sure to wear one of the outfits that he used to compliment me a lot on. Okay. Yeah, and uh, dress myself up basically. And I also brought my computer uh, so I could so be like- Did you like show up early to the coffee house? Yeah, actually I showed up maybe an hour early because I also wanted to get some work done okay. on a script. Two birds, one stone, right? Yeah, so that way I could be there early and could be like, oh, like, I wasn't specifically waiting for you, you know, this is just where, this is the coffee shop where I work, so okay. I'm just meeting so you here. played it really good. Did you, did you ever seek the advice of the, the Facebook group at all? Uh, I think I did at some point, yeah, I don't. Did they give you any sort of suggestions about the coffee meetup that you took? I don't think they give me, uh, sorry, it's hard to remember right now. Oh, but... no, 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 it's okay. It's all right. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just, cu I'm just curious. I think like some of the um, admins, by the way, the admins are amazing. They're so on top of posts and everything. Uh, they gave me general advice on like, you know, try it, just, just calm down, try to be chill. Don't be too uh, like uh, intense on the first time. And I was like, cool. Yeah. Like I know exactly that I'm supposed to do that. Let's just hope that I can do it. Put it in practice. <laughs> right. Know? Right. So um, he shows up eventually, I'm guessing. Yeah. How does it go? Well, he shows up uh, right on time, if I remember right. And of course, for the first like 15 minutes before he's supposed to show up, I feel like I'm about to throw up from the stress. Mm. But I don't. Heart's beating <laughs> real bad. Yeah. You're nervous. But, yeah, but I don't throw up, which is a good thing. And then he shows up and he gets a coffee and we start, he's like, hey. And like, I think we hug to say hello at first. And okay. he just sits down and uh first thing he does is like ask me so what you're working on and i show him my computer i tell him a little bit about like what my gig at watch mojo is like and he's like oh that's interesting and plus it's like i think i was working on a top 10 badass lgbtq plus anime heroes which was okay. a topic that we were both interested in so he was like yeah i can give you some suggestions if you want and and then for some reason out of nowhere he just takes my hot chocolate and takes a sip out of it and I'm like 
a bit weirded out by that because it's yeah, like, that's an odd behavior. Okay. Yeah, it's like a very familiar gesture, right? I mean, right. Like I don't like when people do that to me normally. Like, well, I don't, it's like taking taking food off your plate, you know? Yeah, let like, alone when it's someone who broke up with me three months yeah, ago. Right. <laughs> okay, so he takes a a sip yeah. of coffee and so I'm just like I look at him and I'm like. Um, you're welcome. And he's like, oh, well, like, you know, you invite me for a cup of coffee. I'm like, I'm having your coffee. And I'm like, okay. okay. And it's a bit awkward, but it's also like very familiar and very- He must, he must have been nervous though. That To me, that seems like he was nervous and trying to like, I, I think don't know. He looked very much like he was nervous and trying to hide it. Yeah. Maybe as natural as possible. Almost like nothing happened and we were just buddies, you know? So because how long does this coffee interaction last? I think it could have lasted for a while, but like, I think it only lasted an hour and a half at that time before okay. I cut it short and I was like, okay, so it's like, it's 8 p.m. now and like, it's nice talking to you, but I should probably go home and make dinner now because, so. and he was like, he got up and was like, yeah, I should probably go home and get to work on my project as well. And like, it was nice seeing you. And yeah, the thing is we always had a very like complicit, almost best friends vibe when we were dating okay so it's so, real natural yeah back and forth yeah it felt like we were going back to that friends vibe without the romantic stuff if it makes sense yeah i get it yeah and he was just like goofing off being his usual self like eating snow off the ground and me scolding him for that because that was something he used to do and then okay. he walked me back to my house and hugged me like he initiated the hug and i was like okay, okay Let's go with it. And then when he left, he said, see you soon. Okay. I was like, and I was like, okay, sure. See you soon. Then that's new information to me. Okay, see you soon. And then I went home and felt very proud of myself for how I handled it. Yeah. It seems like it went really great. I mean, he took yeah. a sip of your coffee. I mean, yeah. like in preschool or kindergarten, <laughs> that means you're dating. So, I mean, you halfway got him back already. Um, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... You, after the coffee date, who reaches out to who first? Because that's um, always a point of contention in the group. Like, you get these women, they go on the date, it goes well, mm -hmm. and then they don't hear from their ex. Oh, well, I think I actually sent a message right away as a follow-up. No, like, not as a, hey, when are we meeting up, up again soon? But I just said, I just sent him a quick text saying, like, hey, like, it was nice to speak with you again yeah. and catch up and soon. Sort like, of like the thank you for the interaction type text yeah message. kind of like you know when you said a thank you note after an interview that went well or it says thank you text we'll call yeah it. basically <laughs> and i think that helped me because it was like it takes the pressure off again of like who's gonna text who first after yeah. the meetup mm -hmm. and at the same time it's not a text that says like when's the meetup soon it doesn't sound desperate it's more like it closes off the interaction you know yeah and I liked that I was the one to do that because it felt like I was in control of the situation. He, he's also he's also probably feeling pressure about like if he should text you first. Probably too, and just 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 take the pressure off everybody. Yeah. Um, it's so also, what happens next? I guess because that's a um, that's a big interaction, but eventually, the the momentum is going to pick up here in a big way. Uh, after that is what we started texting more often. Okay. I think. If I remember well, our conversations got longer too. Still, all of this is completely over text. And um, at that time, he was working on, he's an engineer, and he was working on a video game project at an office building that was actually right next to my apartment building. Lucky. Lucky, I guess. Like right. at, some, at some point, I remember he took a picture of my building from the office building where he was. And he was like, wow. Oh guess where I am? And I was like, that's fucking creepy, dude. Like, yeah, right. You're spying on me. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I mean. Making sure you're not dating anyone else. He's got like the camera thing, making sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it never felt like that. It never felt like he was pressuring me. No, it, no. I, I just, no. I just think it's like happy coincidence, right? Yeah. But it felt kind of weird too. And that made me think the chances were probably on my side or I mean, for a long time after that, I was just like, okay, this is going to be, this is possible. And also like, I have no idea what this man is thinking or what's going on through his head or what he's trying to do. But soon after that, um, I'm sorry, just a lot of things were happening at, at that time. And I was, 
I had gotten back in touch with a guy I met on Tinder a year ago, basically. Okay. Because um, I so met this. You you were kind of in this limbo where you're like, well, things things aren't like progressing to the dating with my ex, so maybe I should start moving on. Was it was that the thing? Not really. This Tinder guy I actually got back in touch with him as soon as I went back home to France because I was like, you know what? I'm single. I'm heartbroken. I feel like shit. But, you know, at least like... So basically the guy's a distraction from... Yeah, it's a distraction. It. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, might as well get something out of it. Right, right. So I got back in touch with him and I was like, hey, you want to meet up again? Like, you want to meet up for the first time, actually, one time? More, and, okay, okay. Yeah. And he was like, yeah. So we basically scheduled a date for when I'd be coming back to Montreal. And I went on a date with him. But it was a very weird coincidence that I ended up scheduling my second meetup with my ex on the same day as my first date with that Tinder guy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that and is an interesting coincidence. Like, it wasn't supposed to play out that time at first, but the Tinder guy had a cancellation, so we had to reschedule. Okay. And basically, what I'd heard about from my friends is that, like, we'd heard about this um, board game bar that was fun. And we said we all wanted to go together. And I kind of, like, let the subject slip into a conversation with my ex. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a fun place. Have you ever been? And he told me, yeah, I've been once, actually, and it was pretty fun. Like, I'd like to go again. And I was like oh, you know what, you could join all of us because we were kind of all friends before. Like, my friends liked him a lot too. So I was like, yeah, like you could join us then and we could spend an afternoon there and like just play games. And he was like, yeah, sure. And then it turned out that the evening of that day was my date with the guy. But okay, so you do you like go to this, this place to meet mm -hmm. up with your ex and then have to leave to go with the other guy? Kind of, yeah. Wow, that might have actually played pretty well for you. Yeah, it was a situation where, like, um, I went to the board, room, board games bar, and my ex was the first person who was there, too. So there was a time where we were just, like, alone, the two of us, and, like, trying to talk. And I kind of let it slip that, oh, unfortunately, I can't stay too late today because I have a thing tonight. And he was like, oh, what thing? And I thought, I could just say a date. But for some reason, I didn't. And I was like, oh, just like a meet up with someone from work that we got to like do a project together. And he was like, oh. But then my friends came and my friends all knew that I had a date that night. <laughs> so my friends didn't ask questions about that. And while we were playing board games, I sometimes checked my phone to see if there were any messages from the Tinder date that night. And at some point, I could very obviously see him checking out my phone. <laughs> And checking this out my conversation. This plays out too perfectly. Yeah, and like at first I thought I was imagining things, but then we all went home, and my friend said like, "Yeah, what was his problem? Why was he checking out your phone?" And I was like, "Oh, did you see that too? Was it obvious?" And he was like, "Yeah, it was obvious. Yeah, it was very obvious." And I think at some point while we were playing board games, he pieced together that I actually had a date tonight because then we all walked back home to my apartment with my friends and that's when he started having this weird conversation with me where like we were talking about his old friends just like we were dating again and then he said like do you have any free time like somewhere around um february 14th so we could like maybe get so a valentine's coffee. day yeah and also another thing because valentine's day is actually the day of our first date okay so, so it's like an anniversary of sorts it would have been our first anniversary okay yeah. And he was like, do you have some free time so we can like get together, have a cup of coffee, maybe at that coffee shop where we first met? And I was like, yeah, I guess I would have free time around that time. Why? Is there something you want to talk about? And he kind of just looked at me without saying anything. Like, I should know what, I was, what he was talking about and I should be able to guess. But I was like, ha, ha, ha. Like, if you want me to guess, I'm, I'm not going to do the hard work for you, okay? All right, you're the one who broke up with me. Exactly. So I just told him, like, if there's something you need to talk about, can't you just tell me right now? And he was like, uh, no, not really. And I was like, okay, it's time to put him out of his misery. So I just told him, look, if you, have, if you want to talk with me sometime, like, 
yeah, send me a call, a text, let's set up a date, and then you can tell me what you have to tell me. Sound good? He was like, yeah, sound good. And then when he walked me to my place, he hugged me again for a pretty long time. And then there was this awkward moment where he turned to my friends because all of them were still there. And he was like, yeah, well, since I hugged her, I got to hug all of you now. Otherwise, it's weird. So he oh, he's feeling all- self-conscious about it. Yeah, so like they all hugged and then he left. And my friends and I kind of hung out at my apartment for a while. And then it was time for my date with that Tinder guy. Okay. Yeah. And so you go on the date with the Tinder guy, and I'm assuming it obviously doesn't really lead to anywhere because you get back with your ex. Well, like, you would think so, right? Because, well, to be honest, I didn't, like, I didn't want to have anything serious with that Tinder guy, of course. Mm-hmm. To be honest, when I first met up with him, I was like, it's probably just going to be sex because he's cute and, and yeah. So he's basically. like the ultimate distraction for you. Kind of, yeah. And also, like, he's cute, but he doesn't seem like too much of a jackass. And he probably isn't going to murder me, so it's perfect. Uh, <laughs> okay. Except that after my ex tells me, like, I want to talk to you on our first anniversary at the coffee shop where I met. Uh, I'm you in this... decide not to sleep with him. Well, I'm in this very confused space where I'm like, I probably shouldn't sleep with him. Yeah. So what I do is I go to the Facebook group and I'm like, guys, like this very weird thing happened, but it's probably a good thing. It probably means chances are good, but I don't want to get too hopeful because part of me was like, maybe he's just going to meet up with me again to say, I thought we could be friends, but it's too hard. I want to break up with you as a friend. You know? Man, it's funny how the mind runs to these places because yeah. the, the signs don't look like that at all. The signs don't look at that, but... It's hard no... logically to... When you're fighting your emotions and everything and your fears. Yeah, because there were no signs before the breakup, right? Right. And um, so what a lot of admins and women from the group told me was that, like, you don't have to feel guilty. Just, like, go on your date because it was scheduled and enjoy yourself. But probably don't do anything more than just talk with him since you're feeling kind of confused right now. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to be good. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to talk. And then I got on the date and he was very cute and very good at talking. And there was wine. So we ended up sleeping together. Okay. Uh, Yeah. And I ended up feeling a bit guilty about that. But again, the Facebook group told me like, technically you did nothing wrong. Technically, you did nothing wrong. You're broken up. You owe him nothing. He broke up with you. Yeah, exactly. You're allowed to do whatever you want. And he gave you nothing more than like a few vague hints or something. Right. If he wanted you, he should have stepped up at the moment when he was doing the weird hug thing with you and his friends. He should have just said, hey, let's go for a date right now. Yeah, or just like any time before that or, you know. But basically that, I mean it did give me an extra boost of confidence and of like calm because I was like, even if this doesn't work out, you know, like I've proven to myself that it's possible for me to have fun with other people and to feel okay without him. So I feel like all that culminated to me not feeling so nervous when our third meetup came up. So your third meetup comes up, which is on Valentine's day. Uh, Actually, no, because Sorry, there's just a lot to unpack. And before our third meetup was scheduled, basically, he sent me a text saying, like, like, I suggested Valentine's Day because I thought it would be symbolic or whatever, but that was a dumbass idea. So do you have any time sooner, like this week? So he's feeling like, the pressure then. Like, he I, really wants to see you. I think he was, yeah. I think he had a sense of urgency. And uh, I said, yeah, maybe sometime this week works for me. And... Yeah, I figured you were going for the symbolism. And uh, just to so, let him know that- So like, you kind of like, like led on that you're like, I know what this is kind of about. I know that you're not being very subtle right now, basically. Right, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, he said after that, like, yeah, this week would be great. Like, I was gonna suggest today because I'm close to your apartment right now. And I was like, today, there's no way. Like, I got stuff to do, you know? Like, this is too short of a notice. And um, he said, yeah, like, I figured it would be short notice but like this Saturday works you know and so I go to my work meeting that day and then I receive another message from him after my work meeting 
which is just like a long text block where he shows his cards finally. Well, he's basically a long like, text block. What does it say? It says, um, you can just give me the broad strokes. We don't need a paper word. Uh, I don't know if my phone is actually there, but it would be great. Um, anyway, he said that basically he, he started by saying that he was in the middle of like a panic attack or something and that he was sorry if it sounded a bit like he was rambling, but he just needed to get this out. He said that he wanted to meet up and asked me to give him a chance to win me back. Basically, He said that he had been spending the last three months not really trying to meet anyone else, just doing his own thing, like thinking about life and what he wanted out of it and what he wanted out of a partner that, yeah, he knew it was cheesy, but it was the truth. And that he basically realized he made a mistake and that he'd given a lot of thought to what I'd said about, um, about me leaving for grad school, about us trying long distance, and that he absolutely did see things working out, that he wanted me to give him a chance again, basically. He also said that it's been three months and he knows that I might have found someone else or I might have changed my mind, and that like, if it was the case, like that was completely okay, just pretend like he didn't say anything and it wouldn't change anything on his part, that we could still be friends, like no hard feelings, basically. But that if I decided that, yeah, I wanted to give him a second chance, he'd do his utmost to show me that it was worth it. Okay. That's yeah. pretty good text. <laughs> and it's pretty much exactly what you want to hear, right? Uh, not pretty much. That is exactly what you want to hear. Um, yeah. So what do you do with it? Do you just like see him that day or do you wait until Saturday or oh, no, do you no, even no, respond? Yeah. Um, I responded like I think 20 minutes later because it kind of sparked a panic attack in me. So I had to take some time. And then I was like, I told him in a pretty cold way maybe that like, huh, I just got out of a work meeting and this is one hell of a message to come back to. And I'm actually at a friend's house right now. So do you mind if I get back to you tomorrow about this? And he was like, yeah, sure. Like, uh, take all the time you need. Like, I know it's a lot to spring up on you right now. And like, there's no rush. So like the next day, I think I answered him and I told him like, basically, this is a lot to unpack right now. And like, um, let's discuss this more when we meet up basically. And then the meetup happened, the actual meetup. All of that led to the third meetup. That is a lot to unpack, but with the yeah. context of the third meetup, how does that go? Um, we met up at the same coffee shop that I had chosen. And in retrospect, I don't think he came very well prepared because like the first two times, like my text to him, like the time when I asked him to come back after the breakup, all of those were very like, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to do, what I wanted to get out of that and what I was going to say. I don't think he did that kind of preparation for the third meetup. Not really. So he just came in, just, he's like, I'm going to wing it. Um, kind of, but like, I, I want to give him some credit because he definitely did seem very nervous. And we spent most of the first meetup just kind of dancing around the subject, like, talking about memes and friends and jokes as if nothing else was going on, you know? And then like, I brought the subject on the table again and he kind of went into what he had done the past three months and what he was thinking of and how um, he felt that basically he made a mistake. And he told me about like the two only dates he'd been on in those three months. And it made me laugh because he said on one of these only two dates he'd been on, uh, the dog, the girl's dog actually bit him on the ankle. And I was like, <laughs> not a great sign. <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I laughed for like 10 minutes straight, I think. But the dogs can be pretty protective if, uh, if you approach their owner the wrong way. I guess so. And like, I, he wasn't hurt that bad. But so like it was okay to laugh about it but still I was like that's amazing like I love that dog like I owe that dog a big one like 
good dog. <laughs> good dog. Yes. Yeah. Um, so like how, so this third meetup, how, does he like, cause he sends you a text basically asking for you back. Yeah. And I'm assuming the third meetup is more like talking through things. Mm-hmm. So was it just like this natural unfolding of taking each other back or did he like have to ask again or did you just have to accept on that third date? No, no. I made it very clear that it wasn't going to be a thing where like, oh yeah, we're back together now. Like I told him, He's going to have to the, work for it then. Basically, yeah. Like, I feel like I was pretty good at giving him all the signs that he was going to work for it. Like, when he kept dropping those hints and being like, uh, I think you know what I'm talking about. I was like, no, I, like, I might know, but I'm going to make you spit it out. Yeah. Because if you yeah, can break up with- that's the right thing to do. If you can break up with me face to face, you can ask for me back face to face too. I'm not going to do the work for you, you know. And I think he got the message across and- I told him that we were going to start with like a trial period because after we talked at the coffee shop, it kind of naturally progressed into a date where we went to get dinner at the restaurant nearby. And after a while, I told him like, you probably already know that I still have feelings for you because I don't think I've been hiding that. And he was like, yeah, and you probably know that I still love you, but I feel like you're having trouble trusting me again. And I was like, I'm going to have trouble trusting you again for a long time. And um, I'm going to ask to start with a trial period first. And I don't know how long it's going to be because I have no idea how long it's going to take for me to feel like I can trust you again. I honestly can't give you a time mark on that. I can't tell you how long it's going to be until I feel safe with you again, you know? And he was like, yeah, I understand that. Of course, like that's okay with me. And I basically spent a long time giving him reasons not to do this, basically telling him all the conditions of like, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to take a long time. You're going to have to be patient. Give me an example of of conditions you would give him. Um, I told him, for example, like, uh, you know that I have a history of mental health, that this probably didn't make it better, that I might go through phases where I'm angry at you, where I hate you, where I might not want to answer your messages. And you're just, you just might have to deal with that. And it's going to be hard. Are you okay with that? Like, are you sure you want, are you sure like you're ready to go through that to get me back basically? And he was like, yes, I've thought about this. And the answer is yes. And stuff like, you know, I might not want to like have sex with you for a long time because I might not feel ready to do that with you again for a long time are you okay with that? I was like, yes, I'm okay with that. And I brought up also the reason why he had broken up in the first place. I told him like, you know, that I'm still going to go to grad school because it's my dream. I'm still going to go study. I'm still going to move away. I'm still going to want to try long distance with all the hardships that it entails. And like, you have to deal with the possibility that, yeah, we might still break up because we're both young and, you know, our lives are ahead of us and there's no guarantee that we're not going to grow apart. And are you okay with that? Like, are you willing to deal with that uncertainty, which before you weren't able to deal with since you broke up with me? And he said, yes, I've thought about it. And yes. So I, I wanted to leave no stone unturned basically. So here's a stone that I'm, I'm just curious about. So your trial mm-hmm. period, which is kind of an interesting idea to me, does it, what are the conditions of it? Does it mean both of you aren't allowed to date other people? Do you just continue as is until you're ready to take them back? Or is it like, hey, we're going to be in a committed relationship, but in order for me to feel comfortable, you have to hit all these milestones. But both of you are kind of like, you're not allowed to date other people. Um, yeah, like I don't, I'm not sure if I ever made it clear during that time, but um, like none of us were dating other people during that time. It wasn't uh, like open thing or stuff because also one of the things that he mentioned uh, during our first meetup at a coffee shop is that he was like, oh, like I'm really not for open relationships. It's really not my thing. Okay. And I was like, cool, we're on the same page then. Like none of that probably. Right. Yeah. So it was almost assumed in the trial period. So you didn't have to make it like clear to him. Yeah. And I actually told him very soon also about the the other guy that I'd slept with because 
And how did he react to that news? Because that would that I wouldn't react well to that news if, if yeah, I was I, in issues. I was very wary about that because I was like, that was the very day that you started dropping hints, you know, and like I kind of felt like you were trying to cock block me, except it didn't, didn't work. And uh, I told him basically, like, are you okay with knowing that? And he was like, he he told me like, we weren't together, like we were broken up, we were single, you had every right to do whatever you wanted, and you have no reason at all to feel guilty for this. No reason at all. And this is something I cannot at all hold against you. And so I added on like, but you know that like, I might still think about that guy from time to time because we did have some kind of chemistry, you know, and the trial period includes you that. You really too. left no stone unturned. <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't. Pretty want impressive. To. Also a little scary. I'd be scared if if to do that if I was in your shoes. So you have some courage that not a lot of people Thanks. would have. <laughs> well, it was just like the possibility of starting a new relationship with like a lot of blind spots and a lot of problems that we don't talk about, that was a thousand times scarier to me. Mm. Because that feel like just putting your foot, like getting your foot snapped up by a bear trap and then putting it back in the same spot again. Like, Yeah, that's a great analogy. Like so I'm you, not going to do that. You're just going to make, you're going to make every effort to make sure that bear trap doesn't snap up again. Yeah. Yeah, or just like put my foot in a different place. You know? So so in all, it took you about three months from start to finish to get him back or a little bit longer? Uh, three months, I'd say, because by the time our, by the time what would have been like our first anniversary came around, like we were already sort of back together. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the moment he, that third meetup is technically like the official, you know, like you got him back type thing because it seems yeah. like that, that trial period is central for you. Yeah. But I'm going to ask you and just be as honest as possible. What do you think was the number one most effective thing that you did to make this come about? I'm going to stick with the NC period. Probably so no contact specifically. Yeah. What about no contact? Like, like how you should be using your time for you um, in your opinion, how should you use your time during no contact? It's going to sound very cliche, but like self-care is self just care. It's just number one priority because like for a long time, you're going to feel like you're in a dark room with like a huge, dark, messy room where you can't see anything. And you're just going to try whatever to make yourself feel better. And I think that's the right state of mind to be in. You just have to get to a really primal state where you're like, this hurts. What can I do to make myself feel better? And try to forget try not to think that getting back together with him is the only thing that can make you feel better because it's not. So it's interesting you say that. And I've been asking this to all the success stories that I'm interviewing because one of the patterns I'm picking up on is it seems like a lot of them get to this point where yes, they want their exes back, but they understand innately that they kind of don't care if they get them back anymore. So it's like, yeah. you know, if I don't get it back, I'll be okay. Yeah. Did it, do you feel like a take like because when you go through a breakup initially that's like not even possible to feel that way because you want them back so badly especially if it was like unplanned and it came out of left field like yours did yeah do you feel like that was an essential thing for you to work on to gain that sort of mentality throughout this process do you feel like definitely. that was an essential aspect of your success definitely it's that point where you have to like i don't think you can ever be in a relationship with someone where you feel like you need the other person or you can't do like with that. You can't survive without them. Exactly. And it's okay to want them back. It's very okay. But it's if you're feeling like you can't live without them, like you probably have a lot to a lot of work to do before you can be back in a relationship with them. Do you feel sense. no no that totally yeah. makes sense. And that's sort of the thing I'm trying to get across to anyone listening is that a lot of a lot of it's counterintuitive because I feel like sometimes people come to the website or they, they come to the group and they expect me or someone else to give them like a magic bullet, like say this one phrase and yeah. he'll be on his knees begging. But quite frankly, the magic bullet is that mentality. Um, yeah. Cause it sounds counterintuitive, but it's that mentality I'm noticing. It's like a pattern in almost every single success story. Cause I, I talked to you 
about this kind of stuff and I'll bring it up mm -hmm. after I let you kind of have a, have a say and talk about like what, what you felt worked. And it's always something around that line of thinking where it's like, I worked on getting to this mentality where I was like, look, yeah. I want them back, but if I don't get them back, I'll be okay. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's a hard thing for a lot of women to go through because it's not like, it's not the straight, straight arrow type thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, it's not like, Hey, do the no contact rule and then do a texting phase and then a phone call phase. It's like, it's like the thing that you never stop working on and getting. And yeah. the thing I've been asking the success stories is, is it something that you feel like you can manufacture? Can you like kind of fake it at all? Or um, do you actually have to feel it? That's a, tr that's a tricky question, but I feel like there's like, there's always a period where you have to like kind of fake it before you make it. Mm -hmm. Or like you're going to have to, because like one of the best, like some of the key things to feeling better is like doing stuff, right? Like going out with friends, spending time with family, exercising, right going to like museum exhibits, anything like that. And in order to do those things, you're gonna have to, in some measure, pretend that you're okay because it's not socially acceptable to break up crying in front of the Mona Lisa. So you're like- Well, I mean, I don't know. You could play it off as like the beauty of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> you, so. you could do that, yeah. <laughs> um, like, there is a component of like projecting an outward air of like she's got her shit together like she's calm she's controlled like this girl does stuff like go rock climbing three times a week spend time with her sister spend time painting spend time like making sculptures out of clay all stuff that i did and it's kind of like if you look at yourself from the outside you're like oh well like a person who feels completely heartbroken could do this you know so obviously i must be stronger than i think obviously i must have some kind of shit together you know and then you convince yourself. So the best analogy I've heard was from a different success story. It's mm -hmm. like you can fake it at the beginning, but eventually it, it, it's like only to build momentum until you actually start like kind of believing yeah, it. Exactly. Um, and you felt something kind of a similar experience. Yeah. And I'd say like at the same time as I was doing that, I also let myself have my own time, like have my own moments where I, didn't pretend that I was feeling better than I did, where I just curled up on the couch and like watch How I Met Your Mother episodes on I love that pilot. show. I love yeah. that show. But the funny thing about that show is it's a carbon copy of Friends. You've got the yeah. uh, obsessed, what is it like? The, the guy obsessed with girls, you got Barney and uh, who is it on, on Friend Joey, right? Barney, yeah. Uh, Barney and Joey, and Ted, then you've got the Ross. Ted and and Robin uh, versus Ross and Rachel. Yeah, yeah it's funny. And then and you then got, you got uh, the, the married couple. You know, yeah, you know, the couple that gets Joey. together with minimal drama. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. that is so. It's like how I met your mother was like, oh, friends. That worked. That formula worked really well. Let's just make it. But you know, out of the yeah. two shows, I watched How I Met Your Mother way more than Friends. Really? I, I don't know why, but I love both a lot. I mean, um, I think, okay, it's, it's not a great, like, I'm not proud of it, but I think also something that helped me with how I met your mother specifically is that the guy has to go through, like, Ted has to go through all this trouble of, like, falling in love with Robin and being obsessed with her and sabotaging all his relationships because of her for years until he finally learns to let her go, you know? And then eventually she comes back in his life at the end, which a lot of people were mad about, but... You know... What's interesting about the finale of that show is that they wrote the finale when they didn't know that it was going to get like, like oh. picked up for a second season. So it was like the whole arc of the first season was supposed to be like, if like, if they got canceled, that was supposed to be the ending and they just kind of oh. stuck with it. I don't know if that's totally yeah. true, but that's what I've heard. So, um, I, I always liked, um, Barney, and Robin together. So I was disappointed yeah. when they, when they broke up because they were just hilarious to me, but um, yeah, anyways, this is totally off topic, but uh, I wanted to take a minute and just thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Oh, Seriously. sure. No problem. You, you were so detailed and specifically, you know, a lot of what you said, you were, you were even like not afraid to sit there and hurt my feelings and say, you know, I didn't agree with everything that you were teaching. 
Yeah. Um, and that's why I'm actually doing these interviews because every time I do an interview, I learn something more about how I can improve to advise people. And the pattern I'm picking up on is that sort of like self care type thing you're talking about that like devil may care attitude where you're just like, I don't care if, if I don't get yeah. my ex back anymore. Um, and I, the more and more I interview people, the more I, I actually start to realize that may be the key that we need to start like pushing more and more and more to our clients. So thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure all mine.